chapter three, the ghost in the room. Out here till downstairs. Stead ho! I went into our big sitting room, past the old pan piano, the clunky oak table, the Welsh dresser with its chipped china plate, past our still stuff still packed in boxes from the move, past the walls plastered with Aunt Hilda's war posters with slogans, dig for victory, look out in the blackout, tell nobody, not even her, keep calm and carry on. Past the black metal helmet with the white paint W hooked over the fireplace, past the big dusty glass dome with its stuffed carrier pigeon on its perch inside, its two glass bead eyes staring. I ran into the hallway and flung open the door. The dark driveway was empty. The sharp pieces of gravel st stone white shone white in the moonlight. But I'd heard an engine, seen the lights, and I was sure there'd been a car. I shut the front of the door fast and went and stood in the front room shivering. I couldn't help thinking about the car with tinted windows that had raced away with Dad. The wind moaned down the chimney, making the last of the wood in the fireplace flare in a rusty orange crust and the smell of the smoke wafted on me. Bones lumbered past and lay down in his basket whimpering. There was still no noise from Hannah's room. Maybe she'd fallen asleep with her headphones on and hadn't heard the elephant thud down the stairs. I stood there in the middle of the front room, trying not to panic, but my hands were trembling and they wouldn't stop. I tried to focus on what I'd seen, the eye on the window matching to the shape of the well like that. Was it the next step in Lily's trail, whatever it was, or was I com going completely nutty, like old Aunt Hilda? All I knew was that I had to do something else that wasn't waiting or worrying or being too wound up to sleep. I made up my mind to check out the well right there and then. I went back into the hallway, my face brushing against the manky fox fur on the coat stand with its scrawny little paws still attached. I shuddered as it took my sleeves right up to my throat and got my big winter coat from the stand and put my trainers on. I heaved open the top drawer of the hallway cabinet, rifling under the thicker dress book with a frail velvety colour that would just be in there when we moved in, and an old leather guest book all breaking apart. When will Mum get round to tossing that stuff? I found my bike head torch I'd shoved in there. I still had no idea what I was hoping to do, but I turned the torch on and pulled open the front door. I made my way along the icy side wall and into the garden. The sky was clear and the moon was almost full and the tree branches cast weird shadows over me like a net. A loose corner of plastic tried o tied over the wood pile made slapping sounds in the wind and the long frozen grass crackled under my feet. I skirted the burnt circle where the bonfire had been and got to the well with its crumbling brick walls. Never mess with that well, you hear me? I heard mum's fussing in my head. Children drown in wells. And she and Hannah were definitely not happy if I could see me now. I put the torch on, leaned over the wall, the wall of the well and looked into the gaping hole. It was a long way down. And I haven't liked heights since. I swallowed and felt my face go sweaty. Despite the cold, since that time I fell out of the tree. I tried to force the memory away. My torch beam stretched along the wet, curvy brick walls. I had a clue what I was looking for. I followed the frail rope to the pool of water. My face reflected there like a trapped ghost in a scary bedtime story Dad used to tell me and Hannah, the ghost in the well. I heard a voice behind me and spun round, but it was just a magpie that had landed clumsily on the roof of the house and was pe pecking at the slates. In the distance I heard a dull clang of the church bell striking one. A flaking rod of metal stuck out from the side of the well and the handle to wind up the, the handle to wind up the bucket and I clamped my hands on it and pulled. It wouldn't budge. I pulled harder. Still nothing. It hadn't been wound up for years, I reckon. It might never turn. Could Dad really have wanted me to do this? I banged the cold metal with frustration. 
What was I even doing messing around out here? I gritted my teeth and wrenched the handle as hard as I could. There was a jolt, then a squeal sound like a small di animal dying, and it started to turn. The bucket sloshed up out of the watery noise, dripping black spots. The handle cr creaked round and the bucket inched towards me, the muscles in my arms aching with the effort. A thrill ripped through me, but what did I think I'd find? The swinging bucket clattering against the wall of the well and the handle suddenly wouldn't turn anymore. I cranked. I craned over with the torch. The rope was jammed, stuck between t between broken bricks part way down. I leaned over and tugged. My feet left the ground. I tugged again, hard, and the rope came free. Two, suddenly, and the bucket swung like a pendulum, losing water and smashing against the sides of the well, making me lose my balance. I gave a cry, and for a second I was hovering over the lip of the well and scrambling not to tip over into the dark circle of water. Children drown in wells, a voice whispered in my head, and I seemed to be hanging there forever, suspended between staying and falling, between the garden alive with moonlight and the echoey dead shadows of the well. I managed to shift my weight and pivot backwards, stood there for a bit, letting the fear unfurl and sink away. The rope still welded in my numb palms, clouds of condensation tumbling like smoke around me. Then, hand over hand, I tried to pull, heaving the bucket up. The rope scraped my cold skin painfully, painfully and I really wished I had wore gloves. I gave it one final tug and the bucket was out. I rested up on the wall of the well and looked inside. Water sloshed around the bottom and it dripped and I dipped my finger in, snapping a, ski a skin of ice. Nothing. I turned the bucket over and the water sloshed out. Nothing on the base. There was nothing there. Just like in the story of the ghost down the well. Nothing but a reflection of my own face and a stupid battered old bucket. It must have just it must have been just one big weird coincidence, I told myself. The sign on the window matching the well like that. Lily's riddle must mean something else. Dad's bound to be home soon anyway, a voice inside me tried to soothe. You can just ask him about it yourself. I was about to push the bucket back into the well when, just for a second, my torch lit the bottom of the edge and I stopped, not believing what I was seeing at first. I stared along the slimy inside rim of the base, rubbing off the gunk to see them had it, to see them you had to angle the bucket a certain way so the scratch letters caught the light. Find Sturum V O You're the best, Nate, I heard Dad's voice in my head. A bit tricky that handle, wasn't it? I knew you'd do it though. Cracked Lily's code again, didn't you? I shrugged to think. What did the message from the 1940s and a trail by someone called Lily have to do with Dad? Still had no idea, but I reckon I had possibly just gone and found the next clue.